Gentiles. While in the past, these Sotakis were frequently categorized as either more Indian, white, or African, especially by Netu, who wrote that first book, uh, from my discussion with performers and observers of the genre, I would rather put each group, regardless of their Sotaki, on a continuum of Afro-Brazilian consciousness, as each group I encountered framed the, the tradition as primarily Afro-Brazilian. Yet while Bumbum Bum, Bum, Boy was created by lower-class Afro-Brazilian communities, there are few, if any, limits placed on opportunities for participation for members in any socioeconomic or racial group. Um, and this is a film I took of an out-of-season boom. This is Boyd, Boyd de Santa Fe, and I want to show this to give you any, just a taste of how huge these things are, these performances and these groups. This is an out-of-season performance by a delegation from this uh, group, Boyd, the, Boyd de Santa Fe. So the main thing you want to look for is those big kazumbas with uh, those are huge masks, as well as you'll see the boy dancing in the middle and all the indias and caboclos dancing around in a circle. You see the boy here, the bull. This is a caboclo hail with a huge hat. Okay. So the sense of, of this, of both the mythology and the, uh, and this, we, we can also see people of all different ages and different classes here participating. Unfortunately, it's, it's a little bit dark, so you can't see exactly, but uh, in terms of the participation and uh, the, uh, the public participation in this, Matan Shapiro states, the active participation of the middle classes in the festivals of the people, especially Bumbo Male Boy, is part of a process of social integration that began in, the, began in the 1990s. And the immense popular participation in these activities in the rural districts is part of the improvement of living conditions in the lowest economic classes. As such, the festival demarks a space of belonging, and the coexistence of the mythic and daily reality makes sense." Uh, unquote. Matan's space of belonging could be understood here as a shared sense of cultural citizenship through participation in Maranhense Bumbumel Boy. It is true that a form of social integration has been occurring within Bumbumel Boy groups for, uh, for years, largely across class lines. This is a point that bears further scrutiny and research, however, um, and it's something I'd like to investigate in the future. It was a, I, I wasn't able to do surveys or to really spend a lot of time. It's just a narrative that's really common. Um, <clears throat> but uh, th it, this is a this uh, participation is something I will return to in a moment. For uh, now, I'd like to turn to... Is this thing going to work? Okay, there we go. <clears throat> I'd like to turn to Tambor de Criolla. While Bumbumel Boy is perhaps the most central representative of Maranhense culture, the circle dance Tambor de Criolla, in this case meaning Afro-Brazilian women's drum, is more frequently performed due to its lack of attachment to any specific Catholic festival. As I said, Bumbo Male Boy is generally conceived of as, a, as an Afro-Brazilian tradition, yet it, it clearly includes elements framed as European and indigenous in origin, such as the, we also have vaqueros, you have elements of the, uh, of the plantation culture, as well as you have these clearly s supposed to represent kind of mythic native figures. <clears throat> um, Tambor Chicriola, on the other hand, as its name would suggest, is considered to be completely African. <clears throat> as and I'd like to then just give a really, this is just a short film to give you a taste of what uh, Tambor Chikuro looks like. If I can get to work. I'll talk about this in a second, but you can see there's the, the tambor granji here who does variations, and then these are the, the meu and crivador who set down the basic rhythm over which uh, this guy who's playing the tambor granji, he's got the, 
drum lashed to him so he can interact with the dancers, especially. He doesn't have to just stand stationary. Uh, oop, let me do that. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> for, as we can see from this short film, the dance consists mainly of female dancers spinning and gyrating their hips in the center, generally interacting with the drummers. And the drummers, once again, are these, is the... Uh, the tambor grande and the mayo and the crivador setting down that rhythm. <clears throat> <clears throat> While practitioners of tambor de criolla can be of any racial background, the mestres are invariably dark-skinned Afro-Brazilians, and the dance is considered to be at its purest in the quilombos or rural communities consisting of the descendants of escaped slaves. Even in the city, it is most common in districts that have, uh, have high Afro-Brazilian populations, such as the neighborhood of Livadaji, which is termed an urban quilombo based on its racial composition. <clears throat> As the renowned tambor de criolla mestre Philip Martins, who, who passed away in 2008, but um, his tejero, his house of tambor de criolla is still a very prominent one. <clears throat> uh, as Philip Martins told Sergio Fajetti, tambor criolla de criolla is, quote, a dance that was invented by the black slaves who escaped to the woods and sang to entertain themselves. It is a dance of the blacks, and is only good when it involves blacks, as blacks play and sing the best and are the strongest class of people in the world." Unquote. In Brazil, the land of racial democracy, this would seem to be a statement laden with overtly racial politics. Yet conceptions of Maranhense culture as deeply attached to African and, Af and, African and aspirin diaspora culture were commonplace during my conversations with performers in Sao Luis. Maranhão is one of the states with, with uh, the highest percentage of Afro, of Afro descendants, these people with African descent in the country, and black cultural norms, including reggae and capoeira, as well as local traditions like tambor de criolla, are celebrated with fervor. Uh, Sansone has observed that for the citizens of Bahia, further south, further south on the coast from Maranhão, residents attach a degree of blackness to their regional identity. Being Baiano, Baiana donates a certain degree of attachment to black culture and identity. I would posit much the same for citizens of Maranhão. At the sam same time, when I talked with Maranhenses about black pol political groups like the Movimento Negro Unificado, the Black Unified Movement, they usually responded with skepticism about the totalizing rhetoric of such groups, especially the ideas that someone could be the idea that someone could be 100% black in such a hybrid society. And that's actually a, in the the local chapter of the MNU, the local group has T-shirts that they wear that say 100% black. <clears throat> Besides this valoration of blackness in the genre, the religious purpose of Tambor de Creole is directly related to black culture as well. Although not always evident in public performance, the dance has the religious purpose of giving praise or fulfilling a commitment to Sao Benedito, the patron saint of black people in the local, uh, in specifically Marnense in the surrounding area, in the local version of folk Catholicism, also known in the Afro-Brazilian religion Tambor de Mina, which is also um, it, it's related to Umbanda and Candomblé, but it, it has more of an emphasis on, on as it, the name would uh, imply, Mina religious traditions, which is more based on Vodun worship, and that would, of course, today be Benin, Benin and Togo and parts of Nigeria. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, and uh, Salbenajito is known in the Tamborji Mina religion as the Vodun Verakechi. Salbenegito himself sometimes participates in the dance in the form of a small statuette, which the dancers or correras hold against their bodies or on top of their heads while dancing. And I also have, this is actually, I unfortunately was sick and didn't get to go to this, but my friends Fernando, who we saw earlier, and Eduardo, who works for a, um, a, a new research nucleus in the city that does photographic eth uh, ethnography, um, invited me, but I couldn't go to this uh, this is a, actually, this was a tambor de criolla in a quilombo. And they're, here you can see they're fulfilling a com the commitment to Sao Benedito by making cakes um, to, to offer to him, which then, you know, they will eat. And they also make a lot of food. But the, the, the uh, tapioca cakes, the mandioca cakes, are the most important part, and that's part of the religious aspect. <clears throat> Yet, as Fahechi emphasizes, Afro-Brazilian religious forms rarely conceive of the boundary between sacred and secular to be as rigid as they are in Judeo-Christian practice. As such, tambor de criolla is also performable simply as merrymaking, sometimes in completely sexual, secular, excuse me, Freudian slip, secular locations, <laughs> including bars or street corners. 
Because of this flexibility, Tomboj Criolla is performed frequently throughout the year for a variety of occasions by a wide variety of people. It has become celebrated as a, a distinctly Marinense cultural form with deep, deep African roots, making it a source of pride and authenticity for its practitioners and observers. I should pause here to say that while I have separated these two traditions quite markedly, many of the large performing ensembles in Sao Luis, such as Boi da Floresta and Boi da Liberdade, um, uh, who are, those are, those are called urban quilombos very close to the city center, actually uh, maintain groups that perform both, ensembles that perform both. Uh, and people who participate in one often participate in some way in the other. So if you play drums in tambor uh, criolla, maybe you would play matracas or play a panderal, that really big drum we saw in, uh, in Bumbu Melboy. Or the women could be an india and they could be a correra in this case. Because of the importance of both genres and contributed to the creation of a distinctly Maranhense culture identity, they have both increasingly become spectacles, inhabiting virtually every available public space in the city, especially during June, during the Festa Shadinas. So how and why did these traditions, at various times seen as simplistic and unworthy of note, or else subversive and needing repression, come to be sites of, so of so excuse me, social integration and regional pride? The first upswings in broader public and national awareness of both of these genres was a result of Mario Andrade's folkloric research projects which spanned large parts of northeastern Brazil in the 20s and 30s, resulting in hundreds of sound recordings, photos, and even a few videos. These included the first sound recordings of Tom Borja Criolla and Bumba Boy Boy songs, <clears throat> as well as instrumental music. Since Andrade's initial recordings, other notable Brazilian writers and social scientists have written about these primary, these central Maranhense traditions, including uh, Edison Conheiro in the 50s and 60s and Camara Cascudo in the 1970s. During these post-war years, the Brazilian and Marinense governments began using the broader awareness of these traditions, created by these authors, to capitalize on, on those traditions, as tourism began to take on increased importance for Maranhão. From the late 50s on, both the capital city's colonial architecture, uh, in the 90, which in the 90s was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site, <clears throat> and the state's performance traditions became draws for both national and international tourists. The politically powerful Sarney family, who, um, and of course that's the family of José Sarney, uh, um, who was the president towards, uh, just after the dictatorship, but also was politically powerful during the years of the dictatorship. <clears throat> uh, and they have, the political, politically powerful Sarney family, who have frequently been accused of creating an oligarchy in the state, supported the development of Marinense culture, cultura popular throughout the military dictatorship. In fact, in the, in the album that, um, that, that uh, uh, Maranhama Chisora Matoha was recorded on. There's a picture of him with Rosiana Sarney, the, the former governor of Maranhama and the daughter of José Sarney, saying that thank you for the rebirth of, of Cultura Popular. In, so politics has been very much uh, attached to this. And <clears throat> this continued after the military dictatorship through Rosiana Sarney's career as governor and, and then senator in Maranhama at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century. Despite the recent displacement of the Sarnes and their allies in the governorship by the communist candidate Flavio Gilu, who was here um, in full regalia, and this is Boy G. Maioba, another really big uh, performing group. <clears throat> uh, as Flavio Gino was elected in the most recent election, government support for and use of Bumbo Mo Boy as a political resource seems to be continuing. The cultural policies of the Lula era, though, stating, starting in 2002 when he was elected, have had a major effect on the interaction between the state and cultural performing groups in Maranhão today. <clears throat> An important element of the current environment for these groups in São Luís is the incorporation of the federal government's Pontos de Cultura initiative, which began in 2004. <clears throat> a number of the more established performing groups in the major Maranhense performing genres, such as Tambor de Criola, Pumbuma Boy, there are other ones too, I'm, um, but nothing quite this big, <clears throat> Uh, these groups have received Ponto de Cultura funding, they have that status. <clears throat> and, that's, and this funding mandates that the groups do a number of things, such as procure new technology, such as computers, digital cameras, to capture and to make their presence basically broader on the internet, on, in media, to establish an educational element to their work, such as having workshops or education centers, and open their activities up to public participation. <clears throat> Maintaining Ponto de Cultura status is a regular concern, even for groups with a well-established history, including major Bumbo male boy groups like Boy uh, do Maracanã and cultural centers like Laborarchi. 
In fact, I actually interviewed several people, several of the leading uh, organizers for some of these Boomba Milk boy groups at the Secretariat for Culture where they were having basically discussions with the incoming government about the status of their funding. <clears throat> Another important gov government cultural program in Maranao is the Institute of National Historical and Cultural Heritage, or IFAN. IFAN is the Brazilian equivalent to UNESCO, bestowing the title of Patrimonio Cultural Imaterial, or Intangible Cultural Heritage, upon various Brazilian dance, music, and oral traditions for the purpose of recognizing their importance to those who practice and participate them, in them, and opening sources of funding and other support to these practitioners. Tamorja Criolla was recognized as Intangible Cultural Heritage by IFAN in 2007 in a large public ceremony attended by local government officials, as well as then Brazilian Minister of Culture, Gilberto Gil. Bumbamel Boy was similarly recognized in 2011, but Gilberto Gil was no longer the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Ministry of Culture, so it was just a local affair. Partici partially, excuse me, partially as a result of IFAN and other government agencies' involvement in supporting and preserving these traditions, private enterprise and local and international NGOs have stepped in to both help develop the tourism industry and, benef and to benefit marginalized populations through cultural proje projects. The boundaries between these different actors are not always clear, however, as funding and other support for cultural initiatives generally comes from a combination of different sponsors. For instance, a recently released book of photography and essays on the Bumbumbo Boys Totaki <clears throat> uh, Zabumba uh, was, and that's named Zabumba after the big bass drum, which is also used in Faha, uh, was conducted by researchers from two government-funded Maranhense centers for, cult for popular culture researchers from, and researchers from the University of Lisbon, yet was funded by the Ministry of Culture and Petrobras, the privately traded com company in which the Brazilian government holds a controlling share. And if you, I don't know, I scanned these out of, out of that same book, um, which you can see here we have a Kodoji boy. And we I talked about how much work that takes. Uh, actually has Petrobras uh, sewn into it. And this is a, and this just says, uh, uh, funded by or supported by Petrobras, and it's a flag that would be carried by one of these groups. <clears throat> Petrobras funds a large portion of the development projects for Bumba Mel Boy and Tambo de Criola, as well as for IFAN itself, the actual uh, processes, the, the books, the ethnographies, the recordings. Uh, Petrobras funds a lot of those. In addition to Petrobras, large corporations like the mining company Vali and the aluminum, the aluminum refining company, corporation Alcoa also contribute to similar projects. I should mention here, though, that even though these sources of funding and recognition, even though with these sources of funding and recognition, only a select few performing groups receive substantial funding. There are hundreds of group groups which perform Bumamil Boy in the state, and upwards of 80 registered groups which perform Tambor de Criola. <clears throat> making who receives funding as much a question of connections as talent and public acclaim. Yet the influx of government and private money, <clears throat> which has pushed these traditions to the forefront of Mennonite public life, remains an important factor in the ways the leadership of these groups craft their performances and market themselves to the public. The visibility for these traditions that has arisen as a result of these initiatives also attracts a good deal of uh, desire for members of the, delete, the, of, excuse me, the middle class to participate in them. As a result of their funding from Pontos, Pontos y Cultura and other government initiatives, many tambor and bumbo male boy groups hold open workshops and events to attract participation from university students, young professionals, other people in the middle class. While the organizations seek to attract this middle, seek to attract this middle class participation for reasons of economics, they bring a lot of money in, and prestige, uh, <clears throat> the middle class participants I spoke with primarily took part as a way of embodying what they conceived as conceived to be a distinctly Marniense cultural identity. Regardless of motives, however, this interclass participation has created new discourses of ethics and authenticity within the negotiation of cultura popular in Marniao. To participate in Bumba Mel Boy, there is generally a fee involved because of the need for long hours of instruction in dance and musical performance, as well as the intensive labor needed to create the costumes for every performer. This cost can be high, making it a substantial hardship for the lower caste participants. This hardship is, of course, substantially less for middle-class newcomers uh, who sometimes will displace people from the lower classes who want to participate. In addition, as many of the middle-class participants are young, often high school or university students or young professionals, and they usually perform as dancers,